Hi, hello, and a very good day to everyone here, especially to our guest of honor, Mr. Hadi Junaidi bin Kusin, and the three reputable speakers, Mr. Samuel Aizia, Ms. Nur Ashikin Zainal Abidin, and Mr. Ishwar Singh, Anak Lelaki Manjit Singh. Welcome to the Academic Enhancement Forum 2021. I, Sharmi Tashni, will be your MC for today. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for spending your precious time with us on this delightful afternoon, especially on your weekends. We are very glad to have each and every one of you here. For your information, this forum aims to help give exposure on the importance of academic knowledge and how we will be incorporating this knowledge as future teachers in the classroom. Before we proceed, let us begin with the recitation of prayers by our friend, Nurjazan Ukasha bin Zulkifli. Mic test, can you guys hear me? All right. Al Fatiha, Auzubillahi min shaitan ar rajim, Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin, r-Rahman r-Rahim, Malik yawm al-din. Iya ka na'budu wa iya ka nasta'in. Idin al-surat al-mustaqim, surat al-nasin al-amta alayhim, qayr al-maqtubi alayhim wa al-dhalim. Amin. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Ya Allah, Ya Rahim. Praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds. Peace and blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions, and for those who followed his example till the judgment day. Allahumma ya Allah, on this, bless, on this blessed afternoon, in conjunction with the Academic Enhancement Forum, we beseech thee and grateful towards you in favor of all the infinite blessings to us, your humble servant, to live in safe and prosperous life. We seek your blessing for a flawless progress of this event from the beginning till the end. We seek your guidance to steer clear of event that would detrimental the progress of this event. Ya Latif Ya Rahman Rabbana alayka tawakkalna wa alayka anabna wa ilayka al-masir Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirata hasana wa kina azabban nar wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad Thank you so much, Nurjazan Ukasha bin Zulkifli, for leading the prayer recitation just now. Ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry to inform you that the English Language Society's advisor, Mr. Hadi Junaidi bin Kusin, cannot join us for this program today. In return, let us watch a pre-recorded speech from him. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hadi Junaidi Kusin, and I am the uh, Society Advisor. Uh, first of all, uh, please accept my apology, for I cannot be with all of you at today's Academic Enhancement Forum, as I need to be somewhere else conducting a workshop. Uh, kudos to everyone who put the event together, from the MC uh, to academic and alumni unit, event committee members to the always beautiful ELS president, uh, Ms. Sharon. Now, I must say the department is so fortunate to have excellent team players like all of you. Thank you so very much for you have been very dedicated uh, in organizing events for the uh, department especially. Now, everyone, uh, today's event is not uh, a mere platform for you to collect my cat or my champ points, yeah? Because today uh, we are blessed uh, with the presence of not only one, but three accomplished uh, individuals. We have uh, Mr. Samuel Isaiah, the top 10 finalist of the Global Teacher Prize 2020. We have Ms. Ashikin Zainul, uh, the resource developer of the Statteacher.com. And we also have Mr. Ishwar Singh, uh, the Czech Go Kickstart uh, Top 15 finalist 2021. I believe um, our three esteemed uh, guests will um, not only share their valuable experiences with you, but also lend you sufficient inspiration so you will leave today's event with burning passion to achieve greater heights. Now remember, it's, uh, nothing is impossible, but it is impossible to achieve nothing. 
uh, before I end my speech, I would like to thank uh, all of you again for participating and contributing uh, to the smooth uh, running of the program. I now uh, officiate uh, the program. Thank you very much again. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. We would like to thank Mr. Hadi Junaidi bin Kusin for preparing a pre-recorded speech and supporting us to make this event a success. Without further ado, let us jump straight into our main event of the day. Today, we are very grateful and honored to have our speakers, Mr. Samuel Aizia, the top 10 finalists of the Global Teacher Prize 2020, Ms. Noor Ashikin Zainul Abidin, the resource developer of ashteacher.com and a traveling scholar, and Mr. Ishwar Singh and Alalaki Manjit Singh, the Chegu Kickstart finalist 2021. They will be sharing their precious knowledge, valuable experiences, and inspiring contributions in the field of education. There will be two sessions in total. The first one is knowledge and quality of a successful teacher, and the second one is techniques or strategies on lesson planning and materials development. We will then have a Q&A session where you can ask any questions related to their field in the Google document pinned on the live chat box. Now, let us bring out our moderator for the program, Pritashni Naidu, Anak Perempuan Ramachandran Naidu, a future teacher whose passion is to create an effective learning environment for the students. She especially believes that fun learning can increase the students' learning potentials in the classroom. Without further ado, Prita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sharmita. I appreciate the introduction. Before I begin, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. It's great to be speaking with all of you today. Hello and a very good day, everyone. Thank you for joining our forum today. In this slot, we are going to discuss mainly on knowledge and qualities of a successful teacher. For this, we have our amazing panels, Mr. Samuel Isaiah, Ms. Ashikin Zaino, and Mr. Ishwar Singh. Before we begin, let me briefly introduce our speakers to everyone, especially to our viewers who are, of course, interested to know more about them. Let's start with Mr. Samuel Isaiah, who is well known as one of top 10 finalists of the Global Teacher Award 2019. It was a great honour for a fellow Malaysian to see a Malaysian represent our country globally. His fight started when he was posted to a rural school for indigenous children and was told that he did not have to do much since they were orang aslis. He set up a crowdfunding project to create a fully equipped 21st century English classroom. Over the years, he has launched other projects to boost his students' English learning and, of course, has been rewarded multiple awards by our government. Let us hear from the man himself. Welcome, Mr. Samuel. Would you like to say a few words? Hello, uh, can you hear me? All right. Yes, we uh, do. Right. Hi, Preeta. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the yeah. organizers for... Uh, invited me today. It's indeed a great honor to be here. Uh, it's also an honor to be sharing the stage with Ash uh, and uh, Ishwar. Uh, always, always a good, a great opportunity to, to speak with them, to share different ideas. And I think what you guys are doing uh, with this Academic Enhancement Forum is, uh, is important uh, because uh, we need more active engagement between teachers and teacher trainees. So good job to the organizers and to all of you here. Thank you so much, Mr. Samuel. Moving on, we moving on. We have Miss Noor Ashikin Zainal Abidin, or better known as Miss Ash, a teacher with out of the box teaching methods. Miss Ash has introduced many classroom projects, and one that she is well known of is grammar telling, where she would go an extra mile, dressing up in costumes and permitting her students to bring props. Do you all remember reading an article in the Malay Mail about a teacher dressed up as Maleficent? Ladies and gentlemen, here she is. Miss Ash started her blog called Ash the Teacher as well as a telegram group where she shares her teaching resources with teachers worldwide. She has always believed in moving beyond and unleashing her students' full potential. 
She also believes that teachers have an important role to play in empowering and uplifting one another. Welcome, Miss Ash. How are you? Would you like to say a few words to us? Hi, assalamualaikum. Hi, everyone. So, uh, first of all, uh, I think we have the same introductory speech right now. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you so much for in uh, for the invitation. It is an honor again to be here to be doing this, especially with uh, uh, Upsi and also with the student bar, with the English Language Club, and also with uh, sharing the stage with others, uh, with Sam and also Ishwar. This is. Uh, incredible. I would like to say that this is incredible because this is my first forum with like in collaboration with like teacher trainees. So this is like Sam said, this is incredible because we need more of this so that, you know, everybody gets to, you know, empower and we get to be better teachers for that. So thank you very much. And hello to everyone else who's watching. Thank you so much, Miss Ash. Finally, we have Mr. Ishwar Singh, son of Manjit Singh, one of the top 15 Chegu Kickstart finalists 2020. A teacher hailing from Johor has brought an idea forward to help solve the issue of online learning that many kids face. Convertible English teacher from parents to teachers is an idea that tackles the issue of online learning where education is hindered due to the lack of gadgets and internet connectivity. This program focuses on empowering unemployed parents by converting them into teachers where they will go through workshops and be trained by English teachers to help guide their children at home. He aims to develop a culture of learning English at home. Hello, Mr. Ishwal. How are you and would you like to say a few words? Hi, thank you very much again. Um, thank you very much for inviting me for this forum. It's an honor to be here with all of you sharing the idea. Uh, thank you very much for introduction on my project. And I just want to highlight that uh, if anyone is interested with other projects, they can visit Edification Facebook to get to know on other uh, ideas that have been carried out by other fantastic teachers. So to get more inspired on this, I hope today's session will be a great learning platform for all of us, not only for you, but for me as well as uh, this is a platform for us to exchange ideas and of course to discuss on how we as teachers and future teachers can help to solve the current problem and issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Before we begin, can we give us a, give all of them, our speakers, a round of applause? Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, without wasting any time, I'll hop into our first question for our forum, which is what drives you every morning to go to school, facing the school management task and especially facing your students? Anyone can answer? Lady oh, first. <laughs> this is brutal early in the morning, people. <laughs> For me, at least. Okay, all right. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the very first thing, like, uh, that I look forward to when I go to the school is actually to be to immerse myself in the whole school atmosphere and also environment. Now, I have to say that I am very blessed indeed to have worked with, you know, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, parents who are very, very, uh, I mean, who are very supportive, who have been very kind towards me and also like the entire school environment is very supportive. So I look forward to that. So that itself is a blessing. If you have a good school, good administrators, appreciate them, show your friends, I mean, appreciation. So that's just great. And I think that's the feeling that we are all missing right now, especially in this pandemic to be in that supportive environment. So that, you know, it's it's very difficult when you don't have, you know, like that support system because not everybody at home understand like as when you're teachers, you, you need like someone else to talk to, to just vent it out. <laughs> not like, you know, like you don't have to call, but just like 10 minute talk before you go back home, probably just to make yourself feel better. You feel you don't think about it at home, but you just let it go. So I guess that drives me early in the morning to like be in school because I'm one of those like early goers. I stay like 10 minutes away, like before this. So I'll be the among the first one in school still <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, something to look forward to when you, so that's why like, it's all about like, uh, love for teaching and also love to be in school for me at least. 
Thank you, Miss Ash. Uh, how about you, Mr. Samuel? Right, uh, I think I resonate with uh, a lot of things that uh, Ash is saying. But uh, above above that, I think uh, for me personally, the kids were the most important thing that made me, you know, get up every day in the morning. Because let me just be very be brutally honest with you. Everything can fail, you know. The system can fail you. Your bosses can fail you. Your colleagues will talk back at you. Um, you 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 do things and people don't appreciate it. All these things will will happen to you definitely, but the kids will not fail you. Uh, so focus on them, uh, show love, um, you know, work hard with them, not just for them, but with them, get them, getting them involved. So this is the thing that, you know, that relationship is something that you will build over time. And if you're fortunate enough to build that relationship, you gain this very important thing, which is trust. And when the students trust you, there's no turning back. And every day is going to be like a very, very happy day for you to go to school, to do your best for them. Because, yeah, the job doesn't pay well. Who are we kidding? Uh, it doesn't pay you like, you know, 10,000 ringgit a month for the amount of hours that you're putting in, for the amount of stuff that Ash puts online. Nobody is paying her for it, but it's that passion. It's the love. Uh, it's the significant impact that she sees and she shares with everyone else. So these are the things that keep you motivated and keep you going forward. But if you're looking and you're always fo- if you're always focused on the superficial stuff, it's going to let you down. And one day, you're just going to be totally burned out. So for me, the only way I did was with the kids. I showed them love. They showed me love. We gained trust. And it just went on for about 10 years. Wow, thank you, Mr. Samuel. Yes, hot. <laughs> um, Mr. Isha, do you have the same thought as both of them? Yeah, definitely. As teachers, I think I, I of course resonate very well with Miss Ash and Samuel have said. Uh, every day we go to school, uh, the first thing that we think about is our kids. When we are driving, we thinking about uh, what it, what what's going to happen, how it's going to be. Okay, we have the, we have them in our mind all the time, uh, and and it's and it's affecting us even more right now when we cannot see them. We are thinking, okay, this guy today he did not submit his homework. What happened to him? All right, that is the thoughts that comes in before we sleep. You're thinking, okay, did, how did my lesson went today? Did they understood whatever we thought of? Uh, like Sam said, our work is actually on call 24-7. All right, we'll be thinking about them all the time. And we're having our dinner, we'll be thinking about how should I make my lesson better? What should I plan for the next day? All right, even five minutes while walking to a classroom, I'll be thinking about, okay, how do I make this happen? Uh, while, while we are teaching, while we are teaching itself, we'll be looking at blur faces like, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I did wrong five minutes ago? What should I have said better? Okay, so uh, the passion for the kids, of course, is the reason that keeps us going. Uh, it's more towards looking at how they grow. That I think is the passion that kept me forward. Although my service in this in this education field is still not long, but I could have seen my pupils grow, and that is the thing that brings us forward all the time. From a seed, they grow to flowers. They graduate in front of our eyes. From a person who can't even string a sentence together, watching them writing an essay, that is what that brought us. I think give us the motivation, the most motivation to to be in school. Uh, and then we look at all the other factors that get in. But then at the end of the day, it nothing beats the passion, the love that the pupils give us. That that sincere love, I would say. Something that they will not judge us on. Something that no matter how much we scold them at the end of the day before we go back, they will come to us and say, goodbye, sir. Although at the end of the day before that, I was scolding them like you did not do your homework. But everything is forgotten before they walk out of the school, you know. That kind of soul that they have, the pure, clean soul. That's the reason. Thank you. Well, I'm so sorry. Um, I can see that you're actually uh, very happy to have this kind of students. And I'm very sure that your students are also very grateful to have you three as amazing teachers for them. Thank you so much, by the way. Uh, I'll hop straight into the next question, which is, um, what is the main challenge you face as a teacher and how do you overcome it? Okay, I'll go first this time. Uh, I think the perception of overcoming challenges uh, is a bit different. I, w- I would like to encourage everyone to think a bit differently about it because for me, challenges are great, you know. 
you should always welcome challenges you know it pushes you uh it transforms you it gives you a different perspective something that you never seen before if you are looking at issues pro uh, program and project if he was not challenged if everything was just cool and then the you know kids were coming to school parents were actively involved everything was taking place you don't think actively you don't think uh you don't innovate and i think challenges are great and but what what's not great is complacency you know because doing the same thing year in and year out with no significant effect is it's just going to get to you and there's only two things that can happen it's either you just get you just get very comfortable with it you know you just go to school you punch in you punch out you punch in you punch out 30 years is gone of your whole service and that's it so complacency is one of the biggest problems that i think teachers face uh at the same time for me personally uh personally i think one of my biggest pet peeves was uh initially before when i was in college is a big efficient you know uh, being efficient i think getting things done the right way is usually really really hard uh, what i'm trying to say is the things that ash is doing the things that ishwar is doing is not easy it's extremely hard but they believe in what they're doing they believe that they if they are effective enough in their planning in their implementation in their execution in their reflection in when they get feedback from the community from the teachers from the students and all that they believe in this and they put a lot of effort in it so for me initially that efficiency how do you balance all this and at the same time you are also expected to be that loving that caring teacher to your students so this is going to overwhelm you in time uh, but what i did was uh, i i made sure that i start set like a really high standard for myself you know I take this profession as being a teacher something that's very very serious and the more that I can improve the more I can give the best to my kids the more I start pushing myself but one thing that I would like to encourage everyone to do to overcome this particular challenge of being efficient being good planners and all that is to collaborate um the first people the first group of people that you should collaborate with would be your students that is the most important people that you need to collaborate with yes you can collaborate with other teachers and other other but the most important people will be your students how you involve them in your planning how you involve them in your decision making how you involve them in the assessment of the future at the same time and that is why you know we have forums like this this is part of it as well we are collaborating you know i'm encouraging you ishwar is encouraging me ash is encouraging ishwar these are the things that is going to help you overcome these eight challenges that i just mentioned thank you. Okay, Mr. Samuel, how about you, Miss Ash? You have, you have such a white smile. <laughs> Very beautiful. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, we all get smile now. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, like, what Sam said exactly. Like, you know, like, all of those. Everything comes with a lot of challenges. Um. Everything we start. Like, if you don't, not just like you challenging yourself. Like, look at everything. Every challenge is a good part of your teaching journey because yeah, you will feel uncomfortable. But uncomfortable is good, meaning you are improving. Meaning you will think of different ways to solve an issue, and that's part of being a teacher because it isn't just about people say you follow, you do. or a particular syllabus and you do it's about you know thinking out of the box or it need not be thinking out of the box it's about problem solving we're all problem solvers we want our kids to be problem solvers global leaders right so they have to be able to solve problem instead of what do we do you know that kind of question so that's very important but for me i think like the main challenge like as a teacher um because i particularly teach level 1 students so these are young students from year 1 to year 3 so the challenge that i think like all the teachers face also are facing and like in the classroom or right now situation right now would be like to make sure that all of our students are actually like able to learn in this situation right now or in the classroom that's something that all of us always think about are they able to learn are the things that we bring do the things we bring into the class actually help what about that kid that's sitting right at the end is he doing the work what about the girl who's sitting quietly there is she okay like is she you know fine is she not sick so we are always thinking about you know what the kids would do in class are they actually learning and this is also the same when we're doing things online it's even more difficult when it's online because you have to understand that not all the kids have the facility the ex- the access to certain you know uh, gadgets or uh, material that we get to give to most of our students in urban or city areas you know so one of the things that i feel like um like we should actually like focus on would be um well aside from uh just 
thinking about okay if the kid does something wrong so that's a sign for like you know to help we also should you know like just take a step back and look at their non verbal gestures and be patient be patient because dealing with kids is not easy and uh it's not about experience you you may have you know so my, a lot of experience but you know sometimes you just have to be patient be observant and more than anything you have to be kind and empathetic because we're dealing with kids you know it's not just them and especially if you're dealing with small kids it's not just them it's also their parents so all that comes into your job description and uh yeah those are one of the like main challenges but we will overcome it over time when you know your kids you will know how to do and like i said you know we have to be observant absorb all this you know being patient and be kind thank you miss ash um i before we continue to uh mr ishwar i would like to ask you uh just now you mentioned about um Uh, are the students able to learn that was one of the challenges uh, do you mean uh, the students participation in class uh that is one of the factor like about to learn meaning uh, when i say um, like able to learn one is of course the knowledge acquisition part of course on the other hand we also have to consider about their welfare like are they in the right mind are they sick or are they able to focus for example something might be going on at home uh you know are the parents okay is the family okay so you is that all of those condition actually contributes to a child's learning process whether they're in the classroom or even outside of classroom so not being uh, nosy but <laughs> but we still have to care about the children like i said <laughs> we were quite concerned yeah. about the children's well-being yeah. right I mean yeah. that that that's a good thing. Uh, thank you so much. Um how about you Mr. Isher? What's your take on this question? All right. Uh so uh, looking at different perspective of the challenges of a teacher face, it would be definitely adapting to the changes. Again, this is based on my experience. I graduated in 2017. Once I walked into the school in 2018, that is where the CFR syllabus first started. And mind you, mind you, I was not trained on CFR syllabus as much as supposed to be. So imagine walking into school, registering, and then yeah, you are going to teach the year one students. You are going to teach the CFR syllabus, and you have no idea what's that all about. Okay, so but then there is there is nothing we can do. The job is given. We need to adapt to the changes. The challenge is there. How do we adapt to the changes? At that time, resources were very limited because there was a first year of CFR, and we need to get things done. so we need to find for other places where we can actually carry out discussion with our friends who are teaching the same standard trying to adapt to the changes and right now in this pandemic we are adapting to a new changes changes of converting our traditional teaching method to online teaching method so i think as the year comes by we have more adaptation to come by and that is a challenge that we teachers have to look at uh developing ourselves changing ourselves not being constant like how sam said just go in and punch the card or every single day we have to convert and transform ourselves to be different each and every year challenge ourselves to try something different to try to develop new things in our teaching methodology all right bring in something new so that the fun elements in our teaching years will remain uh so when we challenge when we adapt to these changes uh we could see that uh incidentally when we are chal- we are adapting to these challenges we will actually realize that we will be innovating and that is something that will happen incidentally it's not like we plan okay today i want to plan for this year i want to plan to do something like this. no it's it's never like that even even my idea was was developed out of uh, out of concern from parents it wasn't something that i thought of but the adaptation to the changes that happened made me to move up my comfort zone to think of something that should be done all this while we think of the children welfare like how teacher ashe we think of the children welfare how can we help the children in the classroom all right so when when we have this kind of uh, challenge coming in how do we adapt to this particular challenge in the 21st century with this pandemic okay we think outside the box so we adapt to the changes we bring new innovations into the classroom and how it can affect people's life uh because we see that uh i is it is just uh something that all future teachers trainees need to take concern of uh that 
education does not only means uh, it happens in school it's so happen at home if we are only focusing on school and the at home nothing is going on our efforts might be just going down the drain at the end of the day all right educating is not only means the pupils but also the community uh, looking into other aspects that is why like sam said this job is a very draining job okay but it's not to scare you off but at the end of the day when you see the benefit out of it that's where the smile on your face will make you to realize i have the best job in the world trust me uh if i may add on to what ishwar just said i think i agree completely with what ishwar and ash were saying uh, uh, when when i left ipg or and university i had this uh, stupid notion that <laughs> there is just one way of teaching you know you know that you just go to school go to class you teach and that's it you know and i was obsessed with finding one solution uh, and uh, i think for some reason this 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 obsession with having one type of solution is very common in our system unfortunately you know uh, when we go to state level events or every year in your school you're going to have this all right let me just break it up for you every year in your school you're going to have this you will have some uh, uh, meeting for intervency quote on quote and then somebody will come up with a module and then the module will be used for 200 schools and then you will have program motivasi year in and you are, and for some reason we just keep on doing it again and again and again and again and and that's what i thought it was and i thought it would but it doesn't it doesn't and as you reflect on its effectiveness like how ash mentioned of whether the students are learning or not and i think this relates to what constitutes as evidence a lot of times when we think about evidence we just like you know exam results passing rates but it's more than that you know how are the students participating as peter mentioned how are they doing in the classroom how are they speaking to one another what's going on at home so many things constitutes as evidence so yeah i think one of the biggest challenge is to come out from that ideology that there is one solution there isn't there isn't one solution ash's solution might not work for you my sam's solution might not work for you issue solutions may not work for you you need to be adaptive to these changes be problem solvers but at the same time being problem solvers means you need to engage with your most important stakeholders this must be your students this must be the parents you need to ask them speak to them get data gather data try a program the prototype didn't work good that means you if you're doing something if you tried the program it didn't work change in 2 months change your techniques ash ash modules don't work take issuers module so that's what that's what happens that's that's how it works ash modules doesn't work adapt it to your students needs you know maybe another module of course from another topic works in this topic do it you know so these are the things that you need to practice and i i wish i was i was uh, exposed to this more when i was in uh, college and university you know i felt like i was just like one lurus guy you know going to school okay what's going on you know where's the syllabus where's the curriculum it, it doesn't work that way but most importantly how you overcome these challenges i think ash has shown ishwar has shown of their capability of translating the curriculum translating the curriculum translating the syllabus to the needs of their students that's what you need to do you know all the theories that you are you are learning right now in upsis they are great they are foundations of you making decisions but the theories won't wujud sebijit sebijit like that in the classroom you won't see it you know it's it's a combination of multiple factors so being active decision makers like this is something that is really crucial and the more you get to explore yourself doing this the more you get exposed in doing this the more conversations that you have about this among yourself among individuals like ash ishwar and i etc with your professors with your lecturers the more you get closer to the reality of what teaching is like and the more prepared you would be when you get to school one day thank you so much mr samuel and thank you mr ishwar too uh so we have to be quite flexible and also creative when we're teaching the students because as you said you know sometimes some methods don't apply to certain students and so we have to you know mix it up here and there All right. Uh since I I heard you say college and university, you know, and graduating. Uh so for us student teachers, uh we are required to do practicum before graduating. So what are those some important aspects that we should be focusing on while doing our practicum? 
I think right. we'll let Isha start. Yeah, yeah. Miss Isha, <laughs> go ahead. Years ago, so. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll right, so, uh, it's still, it is still fresh, yeah? so let me just uh, highlight to you the experience of practicum and what to expect. Uh, my suggestion for if you are going for practicum and you're about to graduate is very easy. Uh, challenge yourself to do something that you have not done before in the classroom. That is to find the identity of what you as a teacher is. Currently, when I was a uh, teacher trainee, I did not know what was my identity. I did not know what was my strength, what was my weakness. So I just walked into a classroom. I tried out different types of activities for my pupils. I tried out role play. I tried out using ICT. I just simply just tried out walking into a classroom with pictures, trying to initiate them to do uh, listening and speaking activities. We just do random things. And, and, and at that particular time, we are not evaluating the pupil's progress, but we are looking at ourselves as well. How well do I carry out these kind of activities? How well do I think I can do a role play in front of a classroom? Am I creative enough to produce these kind of materials or I'm creative enough to do ICT-based material? Work with your strength, look at your strength, and I think that will work very well for practicum. So uh, for practicum, the main idea is not to chase for the marks, but to find a teacher's identity of you. Once you have found that identity, it will be very easy for you to actually look into that strength and how you can use that strength uh, for the future use. So uh, besides that, another thing that you need to consider, of course, uh, strengthening the knowledge on the curriculum. All right. Uh, as a teacher, your strength is, of course, the curriculum. You need to be well versed with whatever you are teaching in and out. All right. That is the uh, the structured part of it. Um, besides that, other than that, I think that other factors that need to be taken into consideration is, of course, uh, networking and your improving your interpersonal skills, not only with your colleagues at school, but also with your students. Having said that, it is important to develop that kind of relationship with your students. Um, it's a very special relationship uh, whereby you regard them as friends by the same time, you draw a line between friendship and being a teacher. <laughs> it's not easy because you do not want them to tell you, oh, this is my friend, I do not need to do my homework and it's okay. No, but then there needs to be a, 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 another definition between friendship and a teacher-student relationship whereby you can be their friend whenever they want you to be, but you can be their teacher as well. That is where I think the most respect is earned. Like for example, uh, just share my experience. When I walk into the classroom, I will walk with a very stern and strict look, okay? Uh, so the kids will feel very afraid. Okay, yeah, I did not finish my homework. Then uh, innocently, one or two will come forward and say, um, sir, I did not bring my English book today. All right, I did not even say a word yet. They just come forward, sir, I did not bring my English book today. <laughs> so so that, that happens. But after sometimes you, 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 you relax the situation, you tell them jokes, you carry out fun activities with them because English is all about fun. We do not want them to be stressed up. But at, but at the same time, we need to have that kind of uh, discipline among them so that they will actually learn seriously. But at the same time, try to implement that fun elements into the lesson. And all that uh, can be done through your practicum using trial and error method. It's not wrong to do trial and error method in your classroom because that is what practicum is all about. For you to try, it's not working. Like Sam said, try something different. Nothing, nothing, nothing is perfect at the first round. I think if you if you see how how I was doing practicum, I think you'll be laughing. <laughs> it wasn't how how it is currently. You know, that's that's where the training and practice takes place to find an identity of yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Ash. Oh yeah. What do you think about this question? How long has it uh, been since you did practicum? In the practicum, in the practicum part. <laughs> yeah, how okay, long has um, it been? Um, I graduated in 2015 though, so it has been like, uh, <laughs> been so good. how long it has been like, uh, about like, uh, five years. yeah, uh, five yeah. years. I, I've been like five years. This, one, this year would mark my fifth year in service. So I am still a novice teacher. I'm not like an experienced teacher at all. <laughs> so, but uh, I'd say that uh, practicum days were for me it was well yeah it has to be scary because you're thinking about your marks at one point you'll be like uh, anxiety all you know you'll have all that it is good it's good don't worry but then at the same time you are always uh, because the whole 
for me, the whole uh, practical experience, like how I see it, is is an experience to where you are learning how to teach in a real uh, in a real life situation. On the other hand, you are actually also put there to learn about how to deal with the entire school environment, the school culture. So the experience you get in a school culture about like how to teach, how to practice your academic knowledge. At the same time, uh, like Yishu said, about how to practice your interpersonal skills, your networking skills. So you're in that platform. You're given a platform to practice all that. So for me, it was, I wouldn't say it was great because most of the time I had so much, so many like anxiety attacks. So, but it was okay because like okay, it went well anyway <laughs> but uh you have to for me it was about like um a lot more on the relationship part i appreciate the relationship i have had i like i said i i'm i'm very blessed with so many good people including my uh like teacher uh the the teacher who was my supervisor teachers who were my supervisors and also my lecturers who actually guided me through first second and third practicum so uh thanks to them it was actually not smooth sailing we was up and down because i had to like be knocked down for a while you know, to think that because you always feel like, oh, I know this, I got this, you know, I'm in my third, like, finally, I can do this. And then you go in, like, suddenly your lecturer comes and say, why are you using that? I'm like, how oh, what? <laughs> and you have that moment, you know, like, oh, suddenly it is. But you need that. Sometimes you need that, you know, pull to the ground so that you come up rising better. You think about the problem. Actually, like other people, that's why it, sometimes it's important to have like peers looking at like watching you to do lesson study together because sometimes you don't see the mistake. You feel like it's all right, but you need someone else to say, maybe we could have done this. Maybe this would be better, you know? So that makes it better. And on the other hand, I feel like, again, like you should have said, go for it. You know, it's about searching your teacher identity, but at the same time, do it in a way that uh like you know we're not like go rogue not that of course you have to listen to your supervisor and you know your teachers who are, who's in the school and also your uh your institute supervisor so that's important because it will give you great input on the other hand when i say go for it you do it for the benefit of the kids that's again your main client you do it for the kids and like i said uh, for me it was more the relationship when i say relationship of course students uh relationship with my supervisors relationship with the administrators of the school on the but one thing that i realized that as teachers be very kind maintain the same kind of relationship with other staff other school members uh in the school for example like the guard or like the cleaner or uh so the staff in the administration office be very kind and be treat them the same with the same respect because trust me these are the people who will help you in in times of need because that was the time when i did my first practicum now my minor is science so when i did i was in a school where i mean i was teaching science and english so so that was fine because major is english anyway so there was a time when uh, my final practicum when i had to like uh i was again i was doing my storytelling science storytelling predicting you know in the class and uh, i needed people to like move things and like got more table and like most of the teachers were busy most my practical mates were busy as well so the people who actually came to help that day was the cleaner who actually okay you know what teacher don't worry i got you and suddenly she have like this two three other cleaners other people who came and like you know we'll arrange the table within 10 minutes before my like my evaluation my observation everything was done so value that relationship as well because kids watch you kids are watching they don't just see how because we talk about say good morning to everyone but if we don't say good morning to the cleaner do you expect the kids to follow so we lead by modeling as the same thing that we say to parents right kids are watching the same thing with teachers because you are the second like longest person they spend the time with so you are their models as well <laughs> Thank you, Miss S. Yes, that's true. Um, students are like sponges. So they kind of absorb whatever uh, we do, we say, you know, our actions reflect back on them also. So, um, yeah, since you said about comments just now, certain comments that sometimes our um, advisor or our the teacher who's guiding us back in school, um, at first, if they comment, uh, it'll seem like weird to us or we'll be shocked. Oh, and then we'll start panicking a little. But then in the end, if we, we look back, those comments are the ones which will help us in the future. Am I right? All right. Uh, Mr. Samuel, 
What do you think? Um, it's been a while since you did practicum, right? Yeah, I did. I did my practicum in 2010. So, <laughs> that was like 11 years ago. Uh, I think the expectations were a bit different back then. Uh, the systems were good. But I think when you guys are going to practical, I think we, you have to be realistic about it as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's you're going to be evaluated, you see? So <laughs> if you don't do well, you screw up, you, you're going to fail. Your, your your credits are not going to look well, your, your pointers are not going to do, do good. So I think uh, the best way to do this is to mediate expectations and you need to communicate. Communicating with uh, your advisors, uh, your supervisors is very important. Uh, always talk to them. Oh, if, if they are the type that wants to talk to you, uh, if they are the type that doesn't want to talk to you, then you know you, you need to mediate that, those kind of expectations. But if they are open, ask them questions. Uh, make them feel make them feel that their opinions matter to you uh, ask them uh, uh, also you can you can ask people like ash as well she will gladly help you uh, but but you know uh, send, send her an email ahead of time and all that but we will help you we'll definitely help you review your lessons and all that so but first of all you need to mediate these expectations what are your uh, supervisors expecting because uh, in my experience, different supervisors, different lectures got different things that they are looking at. You know, you can be amazing to Ash, but you can be horrible to Ishwar. So it's it's always like that. So for the sake of your degree, talk to them, speak to them. But of course, you will learn. But at the same time, you need to maintain your own identity as well at the same time. So mediate it really well. Speak to your advisors, speak to your school supervisors, speak to your school leaders as well. Uh, because when they give you marks, a lot of times, uh, sometimes, I will not say a lot of times, but sometimes it's not just solely based on how you do in the classroom. They will evaluate you based on how you are involved in school programs, what you're doing or not. And that if you're spending three months worth of practical and uh, at the end of three months only you found out, oh, your, your school was actually expecting you to get involved in the program last month. And that is the reason why they scored you low. So these are the things. So you need to speak to them communicate with them. Uh, I also think that uh, based on what Ishwar said is uh, use that opportunity to find, find yourself. I think this is beyond the the uh, construct of scoring for your practical and for your degree. You need to find yourself because that will be like one of your first uh, first times being in school for a long period of time where you are you're, you're entrusted with a group of students. You're entrusted with everything, you know, giving them homework, teaching them, doing the assessment try out things that you were uncertain of i think that that is a good place for you to try because even if you mess up nobody's gonna blame you so but you know make that make that mistakes learn from it and most importantly you need to be very reflective throughout that process what are you learning what are you observing look at the teachers around you i remember uh during my time i don't know whether it's the same or not i, I think it's still the same now uh, teachers were just going around bragging about uh, if their kids are all seated quietly in the classroom, everybody just looking at their book and writing, that means they are learning. And I was like, no, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. You 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 you, you got to look at these things as well. And looking at those occurrences also made me it emphasize in myself what kind of teacher I don't want to be. You know, I'm never going to be that teacher. You know, I'm never going to be that individual. I'm never going to be that teacher that actually. Uh, restricts my students' communicative uh, experiences, uh, opportunities. You know, the 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 reason the that relationship. I think Ash was talking about that. So the relationship where they come to you and ask questions. Ishwar was, was talking about as well. So this is the time where you try all these things, and yeah, I think overall, generally, I would say you got to be very reflective. Uh, if you are concerned about what being reflective is, if your perception of be, of doing a reflection is uh, three out of ten students score correctly, then you better go talk to your advisor or you can talk to Ash later on of what is being reflective actually. You need to look at what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, you know, what you can improve further along. What 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 can you probably sometimes you're just being too extravagant all the time. I need to tone that down. You need to bring in other teachers to come and look at your lesson as well. So these are processes and parts of being reflective. That is very crucial. So as long as you're being reflective, as long as you're communicating with this these individuals, your advisors, your supervisors, your school, your students, and all that, I think you're good to go and you will ease your practical. So don't worry about that so much. Hey, thank you so much. Um, all our three speakers gave quite an amazing answer. So um, it does take time for us to find ourselves, find uh, an identity. 
but also uh, communication is the key to everything. So yeah, I think we really need to take this into consideration. Um, so I'm going to go straight into the last question since we are running out of time. So in the past, each of our speakers invited today has contributed something in terms of idea or contribution to the education world itself. So can you briefly um, tell us what has ins- inspired you uh, to do so? All right, I think I'll take the stage now. <laughs> okay, um, okay, I'm I'm not sure if it's the like contribution contribution though, but um, um, I like to say like when it comes to like um, I think first thing for like before I actually like um, like actually started not actually started focusing because I started off more on material development before uh, I started looking at uh, like other outside of the classroom. Um, because when I started, like, for example, before ashtheteacher.com and I was sharing things on Facebook, it was just about like what I used in the classroom, what was working for my kids, you know, and, and so that worked for my kids. So what about sharing with other people, you know, and, and like I said, I've always said this because uh, I've had great supervisors, even in like the district education office who are like, you know, you should share this with the other people could use it maybe they could adapt and modify maybe it would work for them so like heavy heartedly i shared and 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 that's how like it became like a like something uh like right now when we have like when i have like ashtheteacher.com right now so it is not something about like uh when i first started it isn't about money it isn't about like you know to be talking as someone talking in in forums or things like that but it was meant to be shared because it was out of concern for the kids. We want the kids. We always talk about equality in education. We want the kids to be able to learn at the same pace. But we know it's not it's not that I mean not possible possible, but it's we are quite, you know, we have a long way to go before every kid gets to do that. Because um, we need to consider the facilities, we need to consider accessibility, we need to consider uh, about, you know, other factors that contributes to that. So education is not just based on you know like uh, one thing we have to also consider about you know the main thing which are the kids so the material development uh, process actually like i said begin to help the kids um and when teachers share it isn't just about like merely taking it and using it like sam said when when i do something like a module or like i share a lesson plan is it isn't meant to like you know you use it as it is no it's not meant for that it's actually like it's put out there so that knowing that it's not going to work for all the kids not for all the teachers so it's something an idea for you to be inspired maybe you are inspired by that you create something like that for your kids or you use what's there and like modify certain things and like you know adapt it to how your kids need it because it's not something where do i have to follow because i got a lot of i've got a lot of teachers asking like you know do I have to use this? I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm not BPK. <laughs> I'm not the Minister of Education. <laughs> I'm a primary school teacher who like shared things because I found it useful for my kids. So feel free to use it if it works exactly that or add, modify or do something else that might work. It's just to inspire other people out there, you know? So that's how it got from like just material development, like basic worksheets and module and flashcards on to like doing like real things because uh, when when people hear about like grammar telling or storytelling people will be like oh you have to like dress up in costumes and prepare things yes all of those take time but those are like things that i actually love to do i've been doing that since practicum it's just that i stopped when i when i first started i stopped i was kind of like thinking like sam said it was like one thing how am i going to like do this execute this with like looking at the textbook and the curriculum until like I think like the 4th of 2019 when I was like, okay, you know what? This is not going to work. I've got to get my groove back. I get to get, I've got to, you know, get into my, you know, drama queen mode back into my Macbeth mode back to actually teach the way I liked learning. So I realized that when I love learning, the kids love it even more. So again, back to modeling, things like that. So you have to also like look at something like that. Thank you, Miss Ash. Uh, I can see um, how your students will be so happy and excited whenever they meet you in class. 
Oh but you're God. actually showing the energy right now. It's just it's just <laughs> overflowing. I've been this way I've for a long us. time. Be <laughs> 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 yourself. Uh, okay, Mr. Samuel, how about you? Right, right. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think I relate a lot to what Ash has said. Um, I think what your question is asking: What's the reason we do all this? You know, uh, why do we do this? Uh, I think fundamentally, what's important is. What are your principles and your philosophy of education? That is something that you really need to highlight, because for people like Ash, myself, and Ishwar, learning is not about taking a book, photostatting, then giving the kids answer, and that is learning. Or if I want to teach my kids vocabulary, I'm going to get a list of twenty words, give it to you, spelling tomorrow, spelling ah, uh, that that is teaching vocabulary. That is not. For us, our philosophy is this: you know, learning has got to be something that's meaningful. Students has got to experience it. Students have got; they have got to like communicate and collaborate with one another. That that journey of discovery must exist in every lesson that we do. And Ash, I, Ishwa, we do it in different ways altogether. And I believe that the more I focus on what my philosophy and what my principle of principles of education is, the more it motivates me to do what I'm doing because I know what I'm doing is right. It's evidence based. It's in research. And the more I see people like Ash, people like Ishwa keep on doing it, it's, it really inspires me to do it. Because sometimes when you go into school, uh, you will be the only one who thinks that way, and your principles and your philosophies are the only thing that holds on that you can hold on to, you know. Because like I said earlier on, there are multiple, there are easier ways to do this. The easiest way to get your job done is like I said, get a book, put the step, and 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 th- that's that sh- that should be it, you know. The reason what inspires me mostly is to have that solid foundation of my principles and my philosophy. Uh, but also, I also see myself. I don't like to be stagnant. I like to challenge myself. Um, I do something for a year or two. I was like, okay, I'm bored. You know, I need to do something more. Uh, or and I see the effects is just not working anymore. I need to innovate. I need to change. It keeps me going. It keeps me going. It keeps me going. I can't just sit and still just do it. Maso kelua, maso bag, and all that. I can't. I can't do that. I really, really can't. And that also inspires me to be humble at the same time. The more I find out, the more I know things. I realize the more I don't know things. Actually, you know, the more as 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 you know, like I'm I'm doing my masters right now, uh, with Fulbright. Uh, uh, Fulbright scholarship. I think I think Ash can agree with me on this as well. Initially, we thought we knew stuff, but the more we get exposed, we're like, oh my god, I don't know so many things. And the more I get to know people, and the key here is to be humble in that process. You know, when you know stuff, you be humble about it. When you don't know stuff, you be humble about it. Humility is very very important in what we do. Because if you lose that, and I think what you teach, what you're teaching your kids is just going to be less and less effective. So. Like I said earlier, I'm just going to recap. Principles very important. You know, that is the main reason that inspires me. Humility, the one to challenge myself and to be humble at the same time. And of course, most importantly, the kids. You know, they will be your inspiration. Like I said in the first question itself. You know, whatever you do, if you focus on them, things will work out for you. It's not so much about yourself. It's not so much about your professional development. See, you got to set your priorities right. Uh, I've seen individuals who just Very, very focused on professional development. I've also seen individuals who are just very passionate about their kids, um, you know, very, very happy, but no evidence, no research to back up what they're doing, no planning in what they're doing. So you need to be that 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 balanced individual for you to see you doing this for another twenty to twenty five years. If not, like I said, burnout is very real, and you lose that inspiration very, very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. I think all of us have to, you know, once we go to school, and then we will find that something to hold on and something to give us that uh, inspiration to continue and move forward. All right, uh, our final speaker, uh, Mr. Ishwar. So, what's your take on this question? Yeah, yeah. I I think that I believe with what Sam and Ash have been saying all this while. Uh, the philosophy part is actually very crucial. That's what inspires us to go along. You know, we. The rules, the rules that we set for ourselves, how to get it done, is the way that we need to get it things for get it done uh, quickly and easily. Uh, another part of, of course, the inspiration comes from the results that we see. 
all right uh, when we teach something for example on the first day of the topic we teach about this particular part and then at the end of the lesson we see that pupils are managed bad pupils managed to do it that is what inspires us to go forward that is what helps us to actually try to to be better than who we are the product that the kids produce i would say is the reason we try something different and we extend our capabilities even more we challenge ourselves because we know that once we we challenge the kids and they're able to do it that is where we see that the satisfaction comes in the inspiration comes in that is how i think sam could relate with him carrying out one project after another the the product that the kids shows to us you know telling us that we can do this give us more you know they are actually sending us messages through their body language that i think that's actually very beautiful like i said kids are actually very beautiful creation we need to appreciate them as how they are and we in the classroom uh, we are the caretakers of them we have 40 kids whose parents trust us to teach them english for the future you know that kind of responsibility we carry uh, is more than enough to inspire us walking to a classroom thinking okay i have 40 parents who think that today my kid is going to learn english one day he might be a doctor that kind of mentality if we carry forward that is where our responsibility is taken seriously i think this wrap up everything that i have to say thank you thank you so much and uh, that was quite uh, uh, actually a wonderful answer and and to be honest all three of you have given wonderful answers it was very educational and i'm sure uh, that our viewers uh, can get as much input as possible from all the information that you shared with us today anyways uh, all right uh, let's take a 5 minutes break and sip on some coffee before that to our dear viewers please take note this is your first keyword for your attendance form your keyword is scholastic i repeat your keyword is scholastic s c h o l a s t i c scholastic s c h o l a s t i c scholastic your second keyword will be given later by the program mc stay tuned
All right, that was a much needed break for all of us, especially for our speakers. Before I continue, uh, may I ask if I'm audible to you? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Well then, in this slot, we are going to discuss mainly on lesson planning and materials development. We are in session two, by the way. And speakers, are you doing well? Right, we have thumbs up. Um, we are missing a speaker. Yep, All right, I'm there back. you go. <laughs> hey guys. All right, nice. Okay, so um, I'm going to hop straight into um, the first question. What is the ma what is material development? Sorry, um, I'm sorry. Why is material development important for language teaching? Mr. Ishwin, you want to start off? Yeah. <laughs> Alright, sure. Now let me just get the ball rolling. Okay, material development. Um, it's important for us to have material development for our language teaching for the sense that we as uh, English teachers in Malaysia uh, need the materials that are suitable with our pupils. All right, uh, the main issue with materials that we can observe uh, for today is that uh, most materials are adapted from the Western countries that might not be suitable to the pupils. And we are, when we're talking about materials, there are a lot kind of materials. The definition of materials must be stated well. We have audio materials, we have pictures, we have worksheets, all right? So let's just focus on audio, for example. All right, when we look at audio materials, it's actually uh, sometimes it's, it is a little bit unrealistic to uh, have that kind of audio materials that they use in the Western countries on our pupils at the early stage. All right? I'm not saying that it cannot be used, but at the early stage, we need to have uh, audios that are slow paced to ensure that they can actually catch up with us. So why, why is this material development important? It is to support the learning system that's going to happen in the classroom. All right. Um, for example, let's just take, let's just uh, have this situation. I have this material that I put in the classroom for this year one children. And when they hear it, they could not understand anything. So when they could not understand what's going on the audio, they could not progress further. And that's it. Five minutes of the lesson and they could not progress further from that particular material. Our whole 55, the next 55 minutes will be useless. There's no point of us teaching anymore. That is why material development is important in order to support the learning that's happening. Right? To ensure that whatever that we are planning can be done effectively. Uh, besides that, material development is also very important in the sense that it actually allows our lesson to be conducted in a way that is conducted in a way that we love. All right, because when we develop our own materials, we know the pacing of the materials, we know the strength and the weaknesses of that particular material. So when that happens, we will be able to relate the material with the pupils and the product will be a material that would be, uh, that would fit our pupils' shoes. That's what matters when we look at material development. To produce a material that is suitable for the learning outcome, as well as for our pupils so that the whole lesson would be a lesson whereby we would achieve the objectives. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have to make it make the materials that is suitable for the students. And also we are doing the materials based on our own pace. Am I right? All right. Um, the next speaker on my screen is actually Mr. Samuel. How about you? Actually, if I, you sound like you want to say something first, or may I? Okay, I, I, okay, I'll go ahead. Right. I think the, the question here: Why is material development important for language teaching? I think that's that's a very broad question. It's a uh, it's, it's a general question to begin with. So, uh, like what Ishwar mentioned, you need you need to define what are materials, and uh, they are actually two. So tools. Technology is also a material for language teaching. Uh, books are also materials. Music, songs, 
uh, worksheets, uh, all all of these are material. But I, what I would like to challenge you is to look at you don't look at materials as an isolated part of learning. They are incorporated in learning, teaching and learning. They must coexist. They must work together. And the crucial element of, of why is it important? Why is material development important? It is important because you need to deliver content. One of the main reasons for material development is to, to deliver content. Secondly, it's suitable for assessment. Without materials, without you don't develop materials, you can't assess your students. So these are the reasons why. Uh, but as Isha mentioned, I think the challenge, or maybe I think what the question is trying to ask is, uh, why is material development for your classroom important, or a, a, a material that suits the needs of your students? Is it important, or can we just take something that's available out there? I think. Uh, if that is the question, the most important factor would be contextualizing and localizing to the needs of your students. How do you use what's available out there to the needs of your students? Uh, uh, Ishwa teaches in different contexts. I teach in in, uh, in an orang asli classroom where English is their third language. Uh, they, their first language is Bahasa Dakun. So how do I relate that? How do I relate the materials to not just their language proficiency, but also their lives, their culture? Uh, what do I introduce to them right away? For example, if you're looking at festivals, do I go straight away to Halloween? Or do I just, you know, gradually let's introduce this one, this one. So all of this, I think, originates from conducting a needs analysis. You need to know what your student needs, where they are right now. How, what, what do you see them? Uh, how do you see them progressing in one month, in two months, in three months? And if they don't progress, what do, you, do they do? So back to the question, why is material development important? I think number one, it should it's important to contextualize and localize it to the needs of your students, not just your students, but also the community as well. And secondly, I spoke about having conducting needs analysis. Uh, then you'll be able to find out what suits your students, what suits the community, and what doesn't suit. And also that it does not work in isolation. Uh, materials, teaching pedagogy, classroom instructions, uh, differentiation strategies, all these, they don't work in isolation. Everything works together. So you have to step back and look at it. Okay, how does this material work when I want to differentiate the lesson like this? You know, how does it work with the group of students who can't catch up, who is like probably their proficiency, proficiency level is at pre-A1 or pre-pre-A1? How do you do that? So it all works together. All now right, let's thanks. listen to the Sifu. Oh, okay, <laughs> go on Miss Ash. Okay, uh, well, uh, well, I agree. I agree to what the both of them said because those are also my personal experience. And I think for me, like if, if, if I start, like if I feel the need to create a material for a particular topic or for a particular lesson, then it's definitely because I feel my kids could use the aid. I could use the little aid myself to, like Sam said, to contextualize uh, the lesson. And also the main thing right here is to help the kids understand the content you're trying to bring to help it to make make it easier for them to understand now you have to understand not every lesson requires a material we have to understand that because uh, now i share lesson plans as well i feel uh, because there are times when i share modules and uh, uh, like other materials and people can't understand the context of the material so that's why i started sharing lesson plans and then when there are actually lesson plans without any material and people ask like uh, does this come with a worksheet does this have other material you have to understand that you don't need material all the time you don't need sometimes kids there are teachers who are so talented at drawing. They are so talented at singing, at playing, you know, musical instruments. So sometimes you don't need to create something else. You just need your voice. Your presence itself is actually something that you could use, not just a separate material. And anything, you have to remember, like I said, the ma main thing is to help the kids. Does it have an impact on the students? Does it help help the kids? Uh, I'm not going to like talk about like you know like the other things like um, like the basic things that we learn uh, like, like the accessibility of the material, the cost. All those are covered by the basic things that we learn when we develop materials. So the thing that we have to focus always remember it is for the kids and always remember that we also have to think about ourselves don't spend your entire day thinking about one particular material that you're going to use only for set induction that's 
that's a waste of time your time actually your precious time that you could use for other things so think about how you could maximize that one material think about how you could differentiate your instruction because it's very important um, you have to understand that not all the kids if you have 40 kids like you should say if you have 40 kids not all the kids are going to respond to you know me being a maleficent in the class you have to understand that there are kids who are you know just generally excited and there are kids who will be like okay I'm not going to respond. This is not my place or I don't feel confident enough. So you have to understand that. And for me, if I'm creating something like it's not worksheet or module or flashcard, it's something that I wear myself or something that's, you know, just if I paste it on the classroom to run a treasure hunt. So it gives them the experience of doing things. Okay. Now that we have things online, right? It's very difficult to, you know, like do material material everything is digital now so like now if you see me right now right I'm, I'm like sitting i'm like fidgeting around i feel for the kids who are kind of static i'm that learner so that's why when people say you have to sit still and learn no i'm not that learner unfortunately <laughs> so i feel for this you have to understand so in in when you're doing online learning always understand that there are kids who are not going to listen they're not auditory learners they're not visual learners and our learning material should be able to adapt to all those things it's difficult i know it's a very big responsibility just with one thinking of a material but like i said be um in a way that it could be used for many things you have to know how to differentiate your instruction to maximize your one learning material if it's for one class uh if, if i may add i totally agree with ash because um yeah uh, that's not my forte you know and just don't think that for every lesson you got to create something that's insane uh Ishwar has been mentioning about 40 kids in a classroom but remember you at least have three classrooms so uh, ha, <laughs> how are you gonna do that you know so you you've got to be very pragmatic but if if that's part of your skills uh, for example let's talk about Kegu Nazmi amazing amazing guy uh with his uh with his uh what are the message while I uh, with the washing machine and all that but but those are his strengths you know if you're comparing yourself to him at times and if I compare to myself to him from that perspective I'll be like oh, the worst teacher ever I can't do that I can't I really can't do that at all so don't put that that pressure on yourself that you got to contextualize you got to create material or time. no there's a lot of that available a lot of that they are really available for people who put in time put in research about it a lot even in Malaysia yeah you have one here Miss Ash she's already here use the stuff and that's adapted to the needs of your students I think that is crucial so bringing that together with differentiation strategies and all this this is this is important and you got to be pragmatic too guys you definitely got to be pragmatic you've got you've got three classes almost uh, six hours of classes every day and how many hours are you going to put into assessment how many hours are you going to put into creating stuff all these things you got to think of and that is not including your 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 tasks as a guru class guru persatuan guru this guru data guru ict uh. so you need to be pragmatic really need to think about how you're going to play this really well but don't put yourself down i understand maybe some students uh some trainees would think that you know oh i'm not good at this so i'm not good teacher no not necessarily you need to be smart and what you need to do is you need to play based on the needs of your students you know if your students need something uh, a certain perspective yes do that and that's that's how you mediate mediate things uh, uh, as a teacher you definitely got to be flexible that way. don't compare yourself with with others don't compare yourself with me don't compare yourself with issuer don't compare yourself with miss edge compare yourself with yourself as long as you're progressing week in week out month in month out year in year out you, you're seeing the effects of what you're doing be through materials and all that that's most important that you are progressing and your students are learning from if not it's just unnecessary pressure and unnecessary expectations that unfortunately not everyone can fulfill okay thank you so much yeah. Ms. Thank allow you, me Ms. to add on a bit allow oh, me to add on go, a bit go ahead. yeah just just to just to uh, resonate what miss s and you saying that not all our lessons uh, require teaching materials okay let me just share an experience to to amplify what she mentioned earlier all right for a listening and speaking uh, activity for example you yourself can be a teaching material you don't need to bring anyone around all you do is just push the tables at the side you create a circle ask them to sit in a circle you just print a few pictures to actually get them going and you will see that they will be developing the materials that's necessary through their answers and from there we can actually generate more questions for them to start talking 
Okay, so that's why that's what I think Miss Ash mentioned about you do not need materials for some lessons because the answers from the pupils are the materials that will keep us going. And trust me, the lesson will go on for one hour or even more with all the answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I can see many are very happy with um, the answer because they're very um, excited and also at the same time very nervous to go for practicum and all of them are jumping in their seats at this point. All right, um, I will just hop into uh, the next question also about material development. What are the basic principles in conducting materials development for teaching? Uh, teaching of language and how do you make sure this gives an impact to students' learning? Miss Ash? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I think like, okay, this sounds like a very theoretical question. Everybody is going to expect me to quote something from a reference book. Okay. But, but yes, I'm going to refer you to something because I just finished a paper on it. So I think I, I remember the name of the book. So in case if you're using, if you're, I mean, you are looking for like a theoretical reference, you know, you're interested in, in, a, in a good read, you know, up for a good read. So go look for, you know, a book uh, called Issues uh, in Material, um, uh, Material Development by Brian Lott Tomlinson. It has a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, what do you call it? like chapters by different authors who are expert linguists. So it's a good read. You are uh, you'll be enjoying. It's a very theoretical book, but yes, it's a good read for those who are looking for like, more information. So uh, like things that I'm going to say after this is. This, something that actually resonates with what the authors in that book also share. So I think the very first like principle, like I said, like it's it relate uh, back to the first question, which is why is it important? Why is it important? Because you want to cater to your learners. That's why you create your material so that the different kinds of learners in your class get to also participate in the classroom. We always talk about how can I motivate our students? How can I engage my students more? And you also have to realize that not all the kids, uh, some kids just don't respond speaking because sometimes they feel like they're not that proficient, they're not that good. Like Sam said, we have kids, uh, like for most Malaysians, although like officially English is our second language, but for Malaysians, like English is probably our third or fourth language, you know, so we have to understand that. So, and not all the kids come from, you know, like English speaking background. Sometimes the one hour that they have with you is the only time that they will hear English. So we have to, under, you know, take that into consideration. And cater to different kinds of learning style. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I understand those kids who can't sit still. I understand, I feel them because <laughs> I'm that person, I said that earlier. So figure out a way to like cater your material, need to, it 100% cater to all, but at least, you know, like you could like prompt them a little bit, trigger a little bit of like, you know, engagement from all. And when you have that, you will create confidence. When you feel like kids, you cater to their needs, you will develop more confidence because we have to remember that why we create material so that the kids could actually learn how to use English language. That's our main job. We are English language teachers. We want them to be able to use English language. So what we want them to do to use. So use the material so that it could develop more confidence in them so that they will be at ease. They won't feel, you know, anxious. They won't like reduce all those, you know, like psychological factors, the shyness, the anxiety, the lack of motivation, you know. So you get to reduce all those, uh, your, what do you call it? psychological factors indirectly by creating a material, by developing material that could actually cater to them. And maximize learning potential. Like I said earlier, um, it's about like that one material that could be used in many different ways or probably like throughout the whole entire lesson that itself is like great. Uh, and think of it in a way that it's not just academic purpose. It's not just about you using a material so that, oh, I could get 10 out of 10 points. So if the kids don't get that 10 out of 10 point, my material is useless. It's not just that. It's about, you know, maximizing the correct use of the, you know, right and left brain so that it's not just academic purpose. And I think last, like, like you said, to achieve impact. We have to understand that when it's impact, it's not about like, a, not the assessment or evaluation. Like we always, um, what do you call it? Like relate impact with um, understanding. Do the kids understand? Do they get the 10 out of 10? Then we, we assume that if they get that, then we already achieve the impact of the target, which is not the same because 
we need to know that the ability for kids to use English language is completely different. Sometimes they understand, but they're just not comfortable in using it yet. Sometimes some kids can answer, some kids can speak that they understand. So the kind of material that we use, I know it sounds very taxing. It sounds very difficult. Like why is it so theoretical? But don't worry, you'll get a hang of it. Just focus on what the kids need. Focus on your strengths as well, because you cannot do everything. Trust me, you cannot be cutting the board in the middle of the night, assuming that you could bring the board, you know, and do so many other things. No, play at your strengths as well, because you need to, you also have your own limitation, your own strength. So make sure that your, what do you call it, like welfare is met so that you get to give your best for the kids. All right, thank you, Miss Ash. Uh, Miss Ash, uh, you said cater to their needs. Uh, do you take their interest into consideration, the students' interests? Oh yeah, <laughs> that that plays into like their needs as well. Because when you talk about interest, right, it's it's a very like it's a it's wide. Yes. Not all the kids can talk about. Let's say if we talk about, do you like um, swimming? Not all the kids like swimming. Not all the kids like sports. Some kids are just forced into sports. So you have to find out. You know, provide the opportunity for everybody to speak up their mind because there may be some topics that some kids are not familiar. That's why sharing your experience is also a valuable start for the class, especially if you're doing like listening and speaking lesson. The, the we always like often like you know like regard teacher talking in the class as ah oh, it's it's unnecessary all you talking about your experience is unnecessary but you sharing your experience is very important because kids will be able to relate to that like oh okay my teacher is not that interested in netball too you know so they will be like they will be talking but although if it's not up for their interest but they can talk about what is not their interest so. The target, like I said, to get them to use the language, so you achieve actually. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you again, um, Mr. Ishwar. What's your take on the question? How does it give you an? Um, how does? How do you make it um, as an impact on students' learning? All right, uh, just just to add on with what Miss Ash has said, of course. Uh, there are a lot of factors to be taken into account for material development, but one thing that we need to take to account is that uh, we need to look at how English is perceived by them. All right? For 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 students who do not take English as their first language or even second language, when we talk about English, they feel very afraid of it. All right? Do not compare them with us. We had been learning English for five years, easy peasy for us, not a problem. But for them, even even. Even to mention a short sentence like "I'm a boy" itself is very scary. Okay, <laughs> that, 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 that that shows that shows how fearful someone can be towards the language. So our materials must make them to relax. All right, that's very important. I do that in my classroom. Make sure the materials are very relaxing and close to their heart. How is that possible? We take materials that they recognize. Okay, let's take this for example. My materials are always based on something that's trending on TikTok or maybe something trending based on their culture. Most of my students are Malay students, so I will, of course, we we will use cartoons like Upin and Ipin, some things that they recognize, Didi and Friends. Sometimes my my examples will be artists. Examples, the example name will be artists that have been trending throughout the time. Nilofa, for no reason, it's just to. To, just to make them to laugh when they listen the name, oh, okay, Nilofa. And then when they do that, they feel like, okay, English is relaxing. English is fun. All right. Same goes to the materials. Try to make the materials to be very close to their heart. Okay? Something that they can relate into, so that they feel relaxed. For example, if I'm making a video, I have done a video on, um, on 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 reading. For example, I do not give them a reading passage. I give them a video with captions. Okay, so when that happens, pupils are able to relate the caption with what's happening in the video. So they'll feel less stressful if if we only give them a passage that what am I reading? I don't understand this word. What is the meaning of road? I couldn't see what is road. But when the caption comes and Mr. Bean is riding the car, oh, road means driving, road, road the bicycle, things like that. So a visual is also very important to make them to feel relaxed watching a video. It doesn't seem that they are reading a passage, but incidentally. 
through the captions, they are actually reading a passage, but getting an understanding of it using the videos. So at the same time, they feel relaxed. When they feel relaxed, they feel like, okay, fine. I am relaxed. This is not stressful. English is not stressful. Let's go further out of it. So when they are relaxed, we could be able to see how relaxed their body language is and we would be able to see the product out of it. All right. We'll be able to see how much they are able to get based on how relaxed they are and compare it to the times when they are stressful. For example, let's just give them a task sheet all right, with five marks. Okay, then they'll feel very stressful. Oh my God, I need to get all correct or else I need to do correction. But if we do something like a quiz session with your friends in a group activity using the materials, such as colorful materials, all right, then we will see that the productivity of the materials will increase. Okay, so uh, it comes back to the planning, all right. How useful the materials will be to provide an impact to the pupils depends on how well we plan the materials so that it will be relaxing for them. That is my ideology for it. For me, for me, the materials need to be close to the pupil's heart so that they will not feel scared out of it. And as teacher Ash has mentioned about materials to be used throughout the lesson, I totally agree with that. Try to just provide one material that can be applied from the set induction up to the production stage. That is where our creativity comes in. How we want to utilize the material. Because at the end of the day, uh, a useful material is a material that you can adapt and use throughout the lesson. Not we have three pieces, three set of different materials for three different stages. If that, that can be a case, that can be a case, that's not a problem. But then, uh, of course, it will take away your energy. Like Sam had been saying, we have, yeah, we have three classes to teach every single day. And mind you that three classes is from different levels, not from the same level. You know, you can't be waking up the whole night thinking of the materials. So the idea is, for me, the idea is to make sure kids are relaxed with the materials, have some fun, chill. At the same time, let the learning process to flow incidentally. Things will happen eventually. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ishra. So um, you're going to, I mean, we're going to create a classroom environment which is uh, less stressful for the students, like more fun. I mean, it's better that the students don't have stress at all when they're learning English itself. It's easy for them to absorb, right? All right, uh, Mr. Samuel, what do you think about this question? Right, um, I think the essence of your question is, I think you mentioned about it giving an impact on students' learning. I think you should, you should be focusing on that. How impactful are your materials towards students' learning? It's not how beautiful it is. It's not how extravagant it is. How impactful. And I'm going to, uh, I think I have like four main ideas or main principles uh, in conducting or creating materials that I'd like to share. Number one, whatever material that you create for language learning, it has to be communicative. You need to be consciously providing opportunities for your students to use the language. I think that is the key element of many, that's missing from many material. It has to be consciously communicative. I think Ishwar has mentioned about this, Ash has mentioned about this in pieces as well. But yes, consciously do it. If you don't give, if you don't consciously give your students opportunities to speak with the language to the material, when are they going to speak in English? You got to consciously put that in your material, incorporate it. Second, the second point that I'd like to share is uh, you've got to get your students involved in the decision making of what kind of materials you're designing for them. The example from Ishwar was outstanding, you know, of how he got to know his students' interests. But if he doesn't involve his students in the decision making, do you think he will know his students' interests? Already they are from a different culture, different background, different community, different expectations and all that, different context. You need to do this. Initially, it's going to be hard, yes. But in time, it's going to be easier and easier and easier as the students open up to you, as the students are comfortable in sharing with you what they want it makes your materials relevant a lot of materials are not relevant to your students and their needs so that's what you need to do my third point would be to for you to consider the proficiency of your students don't disregard the weak students and also do not disregard the good students as well so you got to continually assist the weak ones and also gradually challenge them 
at the same time your materials has got to challenge the good ones as well there are lots of techniques to do this but you need to be very conscious about this so i think this will definitely help it give a better impact of whatever materials that you actually designing for your student and the last point that i like to say is you need to set clear objectives a clear objective of what your material plans to achieve and how are you going to evaluate the impact of that said material because for example if you sometimes when you get feedback from people everybody got a lot of things to say <laughs> you know you give it to ash ash is going to give you 100 reasons how you can improve it. you give it to sam sam is going to give you 150 reasons but when you set clear your objectives you set clear your expectations of what you want to achieve with that said material and exactly what each would say planning is important and then you can evaluate it and then you can assess it depending on your students depending on a different classroom as well so i think these are the four key areas that i think of key principles as you put it in the question that gives an impact on students learning All right, thank you so much, Mr. Samuel. Um, I, I think we uh, student teachers, we have the mindset of um, we want to execute the material. Like we have to. Um, sometimes we don't take uh, students like how much they can take for themselves, like how much they can absorb. Or is it like, um, is this student the same level of, uh, as the other student? We just like treat them equally. Okay, so I'm just going to execute uh, this material so everyone's going to study. But then that's not true. Right, but, uh, but you also have to remember that you need to believe in your students. A lot of your students have got great capabilities. You know, great capabilities just waiting to be unraveled, waiting to be found. So you definitely need to be very conscious about this. Sometimes it's easy. Oh, class I budak bodoh, semua budak bodoh. So saya ambil yang paling bodoh punya thing. Macam ni kita. These are the, these are the conceptions or perceptions that we already have. So you need to know that your students believe in them, believe in your students, believe in yourself to be able to deliver for your students. Be very conscious of that. So I think I think I I am able to say this because of uh, how I've challenged myself throughout the years. How I've constantly put myself out there. I was not feeling. Uh, uh, I, I was not afraid of failing. You will fail with your materials. Trust me. For Ash to come up with teacher Ash, ask her how many times her, her materials did not work. How many times she reviewed the pictures, the font size, the arrangement, the the uh, how she introduced. How many times did she fail? Ask her about this one day. Have a two-hour, three-hour conversation about it, and she'll tell you all about it. But it is important. It's very crucial for you to fail in that process as well. For you to improve what you're going to deliver to your students. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Samuel. Uh, that was great. I'm very sure that answered some of our, you know, uh, concerns. I would say, you know, we we always have this thing behind our minds. Um, am I doing it right? Am I? Are we going to achieve this or not? All right. Um, so we're actually kind of lacking time. But we're going to jump straight into um, Q&A in a while. So uh, to those watching and also to our speakers, thank you so much for answering our questions on lesson planning and also material development. We're very thankful that for the three of you for sharing your insight. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are at our final slot today, which is the Q&A session. The floor is open to accept any questions, so please leave your questions in the Google document that is provided in our YouTube live chat box. All right, to all the viewers that is watching us today, uh, we did receive quite a number of questions coming from all of you. And um, I'm so sorry to say that not all will be answered, uh, but we will try our best. Uh, maybe through, the, uh, through our speaker's explanation, you might get your answer as well. All right, so um, to our speakers, the first question is, May I know how you manage disappointment because sometimes I feel that our students do not appreciate our effort and could you share some tips too? For instance, doing ODL, students 
attendance and submission decreases. So I wonder if I'm doing anything wrong and if I am teaching well. Speakers? Okay. I, okay, I'll go. Uh, again, the, the question was like, well, how do you handle disappointment? How do you handle disappointment and uh, the, the second part of it uh, with uh, online learning? Yeah. Um, hold on. For, yeah, they are wondering if they are doing anything wrong because um, doing ODL, the students' attendance and submission decreases. So they are wondering if they are teaching well or are they doing something wrong in their teaching? Right. The, the concept of whether your lesson is working or not, whether your online lesson is working is not, it's not, it's not specifically, let me put this this way. A great lesson plan does not mean a great lesson. Uh, a great implementation of the lesson does not mean a great acceptance from the students as well. A lot of times, we teachers, we shot sendiri, you know? We just do like, you know, wow, videos after videos, questions, this, blah, blah, blah. Kehut lah, class dojo, this and that. But I think it it goes back, it reverts back to uh, elements that uh, Ash, Ishwar and I were, talk, were talking about, you know, building that relationship with your students, understanding, you see, education, teaching and learning, uh, in, my, in my own personal experience, when after two years of teaching, uh, I was an English language teacher, after two years of teaching, I realized very quickly that you can have like the best classroom in the world with everything in it. You can have like the best teacher there, but you need, if you don't address issues that are related to the community, to their parents, to their livelihoods, you are missing out on a lot of factors. It's very easy to say, oh, budak ni malas, that's why dia tak datang sekolah. If I said that in orang asli schools, all right, education and school attendance is a big problem, you know. If we have students enrolled, for example, in year one, we have 50 students enrolled in year one, by the time they get to year six, we only have 20 left. So what happened to the 30 students, you see? These are the dropout rates, significant dropout rates. But if I chose to say that, oh, I've done my best, that's it. And I'm disappointed what I'm doing. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is to try to reach out to your students, try to reach out to their parents, try to reach out to their families, try to reach out to their communities. If you think that your own lesson, if you're looking at your specific lesson alone, and you think that your lesson is very good, is flawless, that's the biggest problem that you have. You need to get someone else to look at it reflect on your lesson with you no lesson is perfect there must be there should be areas that you can improve on but i would always say that the teacher himself or herself would be the expert of your students and if you want to find out you can find out what's going on with your students but of course if you're looking specifically of techniques to engage with their students and all that yes yes but you also need to mediate expectations you know you definitely need to mediate expectations because if I'm doing an online class with my online class kids, I can't expect 100% attendance. Definitely, definitely is not going to happen because there's infrastructure issues, there's connectivity issues, there's only one gadget at home for five kids and all that. They can't afford data. Uh, they don't have a conducive environment. They don't have a room like us with a room, aircon, computer, good lighting and all. They don't have all this. So I definitely need to mediate the expectation. But for the individual that asked that question, please do not blame yourself for everything. You can improve. You can improve your lesson. You can get feedback from people. You can engage with the community. You can get engage with the parents and all that. You know, you can go for courses and all that, but it's not your sole responsibility. However, you can't use that as an excuse to say that, you know what, the kids are not coming and I'm going to do it. That's it. Do all you can to engage. And there are multiple ways to do that. You can engage with us personally later on and ask us, you know, on Facebook or something like that. And we will love to help you out. I understand how, what you're feeling right now. And this is something that a lot of teachers go through and we must step up to help each other. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Samuel. Uh, Ms. Ash, do you have something to, um, you know, give some advice to this person who asked this question? I think, uh, like again, like Sam said, do not blame yourself. That's the first thing. Second of all, um, I think like when I first started this online, like we were trying to figure out what was happening last year. When the very first time it happened, we were trying to figure out it was during holidays. And then we had to like, we didn't even have time to go to school back and figure out things. We were like doing this, like on call, dealing with everything. So 
one thing that definitely has helped now you have to understand when you do online like like mr sam said you know you're not going to get 100% attendance even if you are teaching in an urban school you're not going to get because there are going to be parents who are working who could only provide the gadget at night there are going to be you know uh, parents who are going to ask what if we do like during the weekend so there are a lot of things that you need to consider and um like again you know you have to like manage your expectations because it's not just you who who's in it you have to understand the kids are dealing with it the parents are dealing with it especially if you're dealing with young learners it's very difficult to put every single expectation on them i do it so i expect you to show up no it's it's very difficult when you have that kind of very high expectation so mediate expectations like sam said and uh, extend your kindness to the parents as well because it's very difficult time right now uh, of course you are dealing with 30 children and you know they have five kids probably they have like four to five kids in their home as well and you know extend their your kindness in a way that you know like um, for example when i was doing online teaching uh, like you if you feel like kids don't pass up on time like after two three days and then you have to submit the pdpr you know like a lesson plan online by six o'clock by 10 p.m uh, you mediate with the parents uh, discuss with the parents you know uh, some parents can only you know focus with the kids uh the, during the weekend so they say can i submit during the weekend it's okay to negotiate with the parents it's always okay just because someone says that you know not, okay not someone just because people say you have to pass up on time <laughs> you have to think about the person who's actually receiving you know because you can't expect them 10 o'clock i say 10 o'clock means 10 o'clock it's, it's very difficult if we have that so be in a position of negotiation communicate with the parents communicate and and this time every kid is very very different so if you have you know if you can do extend to the parents do ask the parents how you can help them probably sometimes they don't know how to do it so you can guide them Sometimes the parents are, you know, like not that proficient. So you guide them. Like, okay, maybe I can do this. How about like some extra time with the kid? So they'll be very happy actually if you actually ask them personally, you know. So be very kind. I know we are all doing this in a very difficult time, but be very kind. It will come back to you. Trust me. And and everybody, everyone is human being, you know. So respect is also like in a mutual kind of a position. So if you do it with politeness and kindness and with respect. it will come back to you as well you know because we're all in this together we have to understand that hey thank you so much miss ash uh cue the high school musical we're all in this together song <laughs> in the background all right um mr ishwar uh what's your take on this question by this student all right um i would say that we will feel disappointed if we have not tried our best right if we have done only google meet and only five of or five of our students were there we will feel disappointed that's why we should always try all the necessary steps until we have exhausted every single idea we can think about uh, again i would like to quote cikgu nazmi throughout whatever he had been doing all right he's in the interior part of sarawa he do homework on delivery you see he tried his very best until he felt that is his last option all right if that happens i think that is where he will feel that I have not disappointed myself. Uh, I have tried my very best, but the situation is as such. All right, for us in the urban area, what I have done with my pupils is that I have done Google Meet. Okay, four people attended it. Then what I do next is I prepared video, short videos up to five minutes. I upload in my YouTube channel just for the sake of my pupils to get some idea about whatever it is. I screenshot the exercises I put in the WhatsApp group. There are still pupils who could not because they could not have a gadget. I send WhatsApp voice notes. in order for them to just listen to my voice and get the gist of the idea of whatever I'm teaching we try every single possible step until nothing is available and and we know that okay I have done something I can sleep well tonight thinking that okay I have done what I feel in need to but when my kids are back to school I will personally meet with those who are left out I will try my very best to catch up with them that is one of the way we we can actually manage the disappointment in ourselves thank you all right thank you so much um mr ishwa i'm very sure the person who asked this question is very happy um that all three of you have answered and hopefully they feel a little at ease and don't please don't blame yourself just as our speakers have already said just now 
Um, anyways, uh, I would like to inform our speakers that uh, we have quite the number of questions, so we don't want to take up so much of your time. So we shall um, alternate um, alternate with speakers to answer the questions. Uh, is that okay? Okay. All right. Um, all right then. So for the second question, um, any of the speakers can answer. Would be sometimes we encounter parents who could not accept the fact that they have children who need special care, so they send their children to perdana classes. Perdana class. How do you handle special needs students? Um, example: autistic, ADHD, uh, preactive, in teaching the language. Um, I think I'll address this question first, uh, very shortly and briefly. Uh, if you are looking at the uh, context of uh, this, this this has got to do with uh, parental involvement, uh, uh, educating, creating awareness, and all that. So it's a diff it's a very uh, distinct construct altogether. Uh, but I must say that uh, sometimes it's it's not just the responsibility of the teachers; it's also the responsibilities of the administrators or leaders in school of how they're going to they are going to mediate this because it's very complicated. You know, for you to get a child tested, you need to get the parents' approval, and then you need to bring the the, the child to the clinic or hospital to go through the test. But if the parents don't want to don't want that to happen, you've got no choice. You have got no choice, and if it's just a you know, an autistic child or an ADHD child, it's actually very, very challenging. So, how do you handle special needs students in teaching the language? Wow, I think that's a general and a very specific question at the same time. But I think the best way you can mediate this is to differentiation strategies, and of course, manage your expectations. You need to know what are your limits and what you can do and what you can't do at the same time. You have forty kids in the classroom. If you're focused very much focused on creating. A conducive lesson for one, you are ignoring thirty nine. So this is something that you really need to plan. But for me, if what I would do is definitely I will conduct a separate session for the kid after school hours. This is what I would do. And a lot of teachers, I they do this as well. I know of a teacher who does like seven different, sorry, five different online sessions, uh, in a single day to cater to the different needs and the different times of their students or different classes. See. These kind of sacrifices, but to expect everybody to do it is really, really unfair. You're only paid to work from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. eight hours a day. That's it. So try to maximize. If you're only looking at it from that perspective, maximize what you can do. Seek out support in where you can get support. You know, maybe someone who's experienced with pendidikan uh, 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 khas and all that. Try to get ideas from them because if you want to change the mentalities of the parents, you're probably uh, looking at a lost cause. I'm sure many people have tried, but yes, maybe you can, you know, try to talk to them, try to speak to them, slowly try to encourage them. It's a timely process, but when you get the trust, maybe you can change their mind. But when we are looking specifically on teaching languages and teaching in the classroom, definitely go back to differentiation strategies, go back to the things that we are talking about just now, how you plan, how you mediate expectations, and those are the crucial uh, uh, things that you need to look out for but I, unfortunately i don't have like a specific specific answer for you and that's education that's how it is there is no one solution multiple solution different ways of looking at it you just need to find the best way that suits your needs and your students and the parents as well thank you so much mr samuel so uh one of it that we can um always take into consideration to do is um refer to someone who is a uh, good in handling special care students and that can be one of the teachers i mean certain school we have special care um teachers right they're they're good at it maybe we can also go refer to them and then get something um out of it all right then uh we are at our final question which is i would like to ask what are your suggestions of material for online teaching can you recommend any website or application that may encourage students to participate in class this is this is like very crucial uh, where, such an important question especially like right now so um any any of our speakers would like to um share the applications that you used 
okay uh <laughs> okay i i don't use because okay this is the thing because uh when i like when i used online teacher we i think there is a, a lot of resources out there there's there's not not to worry because so many teachers if you are in like any facebook groups or if you are in any telegram groups there's so many teachers who share uh different uh like apps and websites that you could use to generate any kind of games to generate worksheets to digitalize a worksheet to you know how to generate you know like online games with like crosswords and uh even quizzes so there are so many online generators for you to create your own game so look at those just go uh, go online or maybe you can type education games uh, there's not like there's not going to be any specific ones though because i think uh, there are a lot more but do remember that online teaching it's not like you have to use everything like in a digital form because like i said um a lot of the kids they i mean they're already looking at the laptop it's already uh, they're already like tired looking at the laptop you zoom classes and google meet so find a way to make things a little bit interesting so what i used to do usually there's always a treasure hunt in the class i love making them run <laughs> that's what it is so usually when i start the class uh it will be like okay you know what get ready they all know like that's that's the, like the what do you call like the activity of the day like before we start anything they will be ready to run because they will know like okay go look for a yellow something go this is in their home like at home when we're doing online teaching just have this you know like instant treasure like okay find something black or get a rubber or specific thing so this could be their basic like vocabulary training or like adjective training something like that but make it fun in a way that it doesn't have to be digital or virtual it can be something that involves movement as well you know so uh think like i said not like thinking uh, of course that you can use there so many platforms out there but also consider the fact that you know what it will be fun to move around as well you know maybe mix something not everything have to be uh, like every have to be a game it can be something that you do together why don't bring out like do activities you know like okay maybe we'll do a cooking class today maybe we'll cut and form you know uh, something together so it can be project as well it doesn't have to be like video video or game game or quizzes quizzes all the time so you can magnify it in many times and of course manage your expectations because not all the kids are going to participate and in that one hour you're going to have kids so like teacher what mute there mute here there're going to be a lot of like you know those things going on so manage your expectation don't cram everything don't think you have to use all the websites and apps in one lesson you don't have to you can just use one or you don't have to use any as well you know just manage your expectations well so that everything you know so that the kids learn something it can be just one thing but at least they learn Thank you Miss Ash. Uh how about you Mr. Ishra? Do you do you go through the same thing? Yes, uh of course uh like what Miss Ash said that uh, don't let them to look at the screen for a long time. However, if if they need suggestions of what I had been using in my classroom, uh it's the basic kahoot quizzes. Then I also have a uh, word wall and live worksheets all right it's very interesting live worksheets can be interesting but for a short time in between the classes yes you can use this kind of things for a short time but if it's for a wider purpose for example like how miss ash said try something off screen like a project uh, ask them to do a scrapbook uh, like like for my class for example we have my my pupils have their own dictionary right their own dictionary they call it my dictionary whereby they will put their own words into it you can have some kind of project like that on a weekly basis just randomly give them five words on the screen and ask them okay i give you five words on the screen now copy these words and then you go and you go and get the uh, get the items from your from your home why don't you write down what can you see based on these items describe the items write it on the book take a photo and send it to you if it not only helps pupils to be off screen we need to understand when we are looking at primary school kids it's important to enhance their motor skills if they are on the laptop all the time they will not be writing with their pencils uh, that that is a disaster in waiting for us when we go back to school later on. i think we have seen that this year uh, the handwriting was horrible we need i i one thing i keep telling my kids whenever i go back to school last march was my kids do not put capital letter for the first sentence anymore 
and they do not put full stop anymore. Every single one of them, I will ask them to repeat the same thing. I walk around, I will tell, I will tell the same thing. That is the reality because we have been using technology. They do not know how to put the capital alphabet on the laptop or their handphone. So they were just, okay, it's okay. I just type the sentence as a whole. There is no alphabet at the start. Ah, It's like typing a message in a WhatsApp. I don't need to put a full stop. So that's the reality after one year. And that is what's happening in the school. I'm giving you live input of what I had to deal with. I had to spend 10 minutes to remind everyone, put a capital letter, put a full stop. Why is this no capital letter? And that that is the impact of excessive usage of technology that we do not realize and that we, that that's what we as teachers must take note actually uh, looking into all this so off screen is very important on screen is so important i've given you some examples uh, that you can take into consideration but you can actually be more creative at home because at home they have all the items there's one joke i read in twitter recently stating that a kid told his student Sir, saya lupa bawa buku ni. Dan Sir pun tanya, where are you? Dekat rumah. Kalau dekat rumah, kenapa nak lupa bawa buku? Uh, so, at home, they have all the items that they need. There is no excuse. Sir, saya tak bawa buku ni. Saya tak bawa gunting. No excuse at all. Everything is there. Alright? So, that's where the home is a place where you can actually carry out more interesting activities. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Mr. Isha. I think, um, I think some of us or all of us can relate to the fact that we are different when i mean when we write and also uh, when we type so it's impacting us as well whenever we write uh, it will be all over the place because we're always on our keyboard always tapping on a phone so we don't do uh, like what you said capitalize full stop the commas the punctuation just goes all over the place all right um finally mr samuel do you have something to say well, I think uh, just to wrap it up, I think fundamentally, uh, despite the difference of doing it online or doing it in person, what fundamentally needs to remain the same is what constitutes as learning. What is your principles of learning? I'm going back there again. Because if it's, if it's for Ash, again, if he thinks learning is communicative, collaborative, she won't be going online in an online lesson, sharing a screen, and then nag for 45 minutes. And then, okay, that's it. Ambil kerja rumah, siap, hantar. That's it. Because that, to her, is not learning at all. Alright? What she would have done is probably give like a 15-minute explanation, show a video, get the kids to do some programs, okay, get a project, do it at home, clean your house, ke, do something, blah, blah, blah. The next day, you come back, you show her something of what you've done, and that, to her, is learning. So, regardless of the medium of delivery, what what is the same is that individual it is the teacher i've seen teachers do this you know they bring what they do in classrooms online and then they complain why their students are not engaging because when on when you're online it's it's going to be very obvious if the kids don't like it they're just going to turn off their computer not going to respond or just go somewhere else somewhere else altogether if it's in the classroom they are forced to be there so i think it's it's best for us to be reflective what are our philosophies what are our principles and if we have that right in whatever we do our priorities is going to be right it's what we are going to focus on and then bring on whatever applications for example you can use khood in a completely wrong way you know just squeeze 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 every day every day is it then it's pointless already so that's how you need to do this you know you need to have your priorities right you need to set your principles right what you believe in as educate what is educating what is learning what constitutes as learning and if you have that right then whatever medium that you're using, you're going to make the best decision. And then you trust yourself. You trust yourself that you're making the right decision for your students, for their families, for their communities, for the challenges and obstacles that they face at home. And that, that's what makes a successful lesson, be it online or be it in person. You, not the tools, but you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Samuel. Uh, I mean, that really answers the question coming from three different perspectives but we also can uh, I mean we literally can relate to whatever they have said and I'm very sure um, many of us are very happy uh, just knowing this itself anyways thank you so much for answering answering the question and this is actually the end of our Q&A session All right, thank you to our moderator, Pritash Ninaidu. 
I would also like to say thank you to our three amazing guest speakers, Mr. Samuel Aizia, Mr. Ashikin Zainal, and Mr. Ishwar Singh for their inputs just now. I hope that all of you enjoyed and learned a thing or two from both the slots, especially as NOVA's teachers are teachers-to-be. Once again, we would like to extend our utmost gratitude to the speakers for spending some of their time with us. Now, let us watch a video montage which will be shown by our technical team. That's the end of our montage. Thank you, technical team. Dear viewers, please take note that the second keyword for the attendance form is SAPIAN. I repeat, SAPIAN. S-A-P-I-E-N-T. I repeat again, the second keyword is SAPIAN. S-A-P-I-E-N-T. Now, the link for the attendance form has been released on the YouTube live chat box. Please fill in the attendance to get your mic at our chat. As a reminder, please make sure that your information is keyed in correctly. This form will only be closed in half an hour. I also hope that you remember the keywords that are given to you. Sadly, we have reached the end of our Academic Enhancement Forum 2021. Before dismissing, we would like to ask everyone to turn on their cameras for a photo session. Let us all strike some poses for the pictures. Are you all ready? All right, everyone. So we're going to take three photos, three shots of photos. Okay, be ready. This is the first shot. One, two, and three. All right. This is the second one. Try your best pose. One, two, and three. All right, the last one. Smile in one, two, and three. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, and our technical team. All right, that is all for Academic Enhancement Forum 2021. Once again, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us for today, especially to the speakers who have spent an extra time with us. Goodbye and have a great evening.